Hi everyone. It's uh, it's great to be with all of you here today. Uh, thanks so much, Guilherme, for the the invitation to to be part of this event. Uh, it's it's quite a pleasure. So let me just start by sharing my screen here. All right. So hopefully you can see my my screen and and the topic for for the stock today which is really all about unraveling the big picture so all of us have seen this you know big impressive numbers like this three million videos watched on youtube five million i would say billion images hosted by Flickr in 2010 alone or even 294 billion emails exchanged every single day. These are such large numbers, such large quantities that it's really even hard for us humans to, to understand. In what you might call this kind of massive data deluge, right? The phenomenon of big data. And as Christian von Bayer puts it so well in this great book called Information, information gently but relentlessly drizzles down on us in an invisible, impalpable electric rain, right? You have that sense of being literally overwhelmed with data. That data is actually falling down on you like rain. But in fact, this is not entirely a new uh, feeling. Humans have actually felt this in other periods of, of history. So I will take you back 800 years to a period in medieval Europe where our ancestors were actually having a very similar feeling. And back then, Europe was literally inundated by new knowledge coming from ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And this is a passage by Vincent of Beauvoir saying that the huge number of books being produced make it extremely hard to be retained in the mind, right? For you to memorize everything that's currently being written. It was a pretty scary feeling for, for Europeans back then. And also, of course, there's this amazing quote by Adrian Bellet in, uh, in 1685 that says, in a very <laughs> in a very dark way we have reason to fear that the multitude of books which grows every day in a prodigious fashion will make the following centuries fall into a state as barbarous as that of the centuries that followed the fall of the roman empire so this was a really kind of apocalyptic type of of fear and if you really want to dig into this this uh, sense of being overwhelmed with new information. You can look at this book by Anne Blair called Too Much to Know. There's multiple passages uh, pertaining to this, again, this feeling uh, in high medieval Europe, in the high middle ages, uh, of being inundated by, by uh, data, this information overload. And one of the things back then that was useful to make sense of this avalanche of new information was to use graphical metaphors, right? Visual metaphors to convey a lot of this new information. So this was a really important period. I would really think this is the genesis of information design as people back then were experimenting with all types of visual metaphors and diagrams and charts. And these are some of the ones that you might encounter back then. You know, this book called uh, Nuremberg Chronicle by Artman Shadow is a great example of uh, using really complex and intricate diagrams to explain fairly complex uh, phenomena. And this was even more significant because in this specific uh, manuscript, it was, it was actually depicting visually many European cities that have never been visualized in such a, a way before. This is, of course, uh, at a time that precedes photography by many centuries. 
or even in the work of Athanasius Kircher, uh, he was absolutely obsessed with graphical representation. He wanted to replace text altogether and use diagrams as a means to convey information. Even some more experimental work by Giorgio Camillo, this was called the theater of memory. It was actually a fairly common metaphor where you would use a physical environment, a space, uh, let's say in this case, uh, um, the a theater kind of a setting to imply instances of information so that it was easier for you to memorize and recall some of that specifically uh, specific information. But of all metaphors that emerged during this time, right, in the high Middle Ages, the tree was perhaps the more prevalent. And many of you might wonder why the tree necessarily. And if you look attentively at the history of humans, right, we have used trees for millennia for everything you can think of, from food to weaponry, for medicine, for energy, right? We have relied on trees for almost everything. And it's perhaps no accident that most cultures and civilizations have, uh, have the, the concept of a sacred tree. We can see sacred trees uh, all the way back to ancient Babylon, uh, ancient Egypt also had different versions of a sacred tree. Christianity, of course, adds two different types of sacred trees portrayed in the Bible. Uh, Buddhism is, of course, uh, as the, the famous Bodhi tree, right? The, the, the large fig tree that, was, that is still sacred to, to Buddhists everywhere. And even Mayans themselves, they had also a sacred tree. It was called the Yashte tree of life. They unified it, the three realms of the Mayas, the underworld, the, the, the real, and the celestial. So over time, many of these sacred symbols became knowledge classification systems, which means they were used to uh, convey specific information, information that was more hierarchical, right? So the sense of, of balance, of authority, of a given chain of command, right? Of order as well. And at times also as a symbol of unity. So we can see trees being used uh, in those days in medieval Europe as a means to convey morality. This was actually a very common uh, topic to, you know, the things that you should do and you should not do as an abiding religious citizen. Also, of course, consanguinity, right? The blood ties between people, as you can see in these amazing examples from, from that period. Also, of course, the most obvious of all, mapping genealogy, right? Family trees. Many of you have seen a family tree before. Some of you might even have your own family tree uh, designed in such a way. And these are examples that go all the way back to the, the 15th century. And even, of course, mapping knowledge. Uh, Ramon Lul, the Spanish scholar Ramon Lul, is famous for having invented the concept of knowledge in the format of a tree, right? And, and that's a metaphor we use every day, right? When we say uh, genetics is a branch of science, when we say biology is a branch of science, we are employing a linguistic metaphor that has been created by Spanish schooler Ramon Lul. And these are some of the beautiful, the, the earliest trees of knowledge that he has created back in the 13th century. Later on, of course, Ernest Eckel, uh, a, a huge advocate of Darwin himself, has created a variety of different trees mapping species. But what's interesting is that we are really at this turning point uh, from trees to networks, where in many ways trees are no longer able to, to provide the type of support and explanation we need for understanding many of the complex systems we have around the world. And this can be really understood by the work of uh, French philosophers uh, Deleuze and Guattari. And they mentioned this sort of transition when they wrote, we are tired of trees. We should stop believing in trees. They have made us suffer too much. All of our culture is funded on them from biology to linguistics. And they are really opposing this type of hierarchical 
view of the world and human society. And of course, the uh, American scientist Warren Weaver went a step further in 1948 when he published an article on the topic of organized complexity. And Weaver says, says that in the, 18, in the 17, 18, and 19th centuries, scientists who were mostly concerned about how one single variable influences another in what he considers to be problems of simplicity. Towards the first half of the 20th century, but scientists be, became aware that there's not just one or two or three variables, there's actually many more, but they were thought to be fairly chaotic or disorganized to what Weaver considers to be problems, problems of disorganized complexity. And then moving, of course, to the second half of the 20th century and, and the current moment in time, not only do, do scientists now understand that there's a variety, a myriad of, of variables going on, but they are also in many, in many cases, highly interconnected and highly interdependent to what we would consider to be the third stage of, of science exploration, which is dealing with problems of organized complexity. And in order to unravel some of these problems, the network has emerged as the preferred metaphor, right? And we're going to see how this metaphor has, has changed many areas of human knowledge. The first one is how we actually look and understand ecosystems. No longer do we have the simplistic chain that many of us learned in, at school, right? The predator chain where cats eat mice, mice might uh, cover bees and clever and so on, right? So we, this, this very simplistic way of looking at ecosystems is of course not appropriate. The more we understand ecosystems around the globe, they resemble something like this. This is a really dense network covering 100 species that interact with the codfish, Bacalhau, uh, off the coast of Northeastern Canada. It's a remarkable example of, of what a true ecosystem looks like. Also, we can see this transition in how we understand the human brain. For quite some time, we used to think of, of the human brain as this modular, centralized organ responsible for a given set of actions and behaviors, right? But the more we unravel the mysteries of the human brain, the more we see it as a large music symphony played by hundreds and thousands of instruments, right? And this is actually a beautiful uh, picture of, of the human brain mapping 10,000 neurons and 30 million connections in one single image. We can also see this transition in the way we categorize human knowledge. These are, this is a beautiful tree created for the French Encyclopedia uh, in 1751 by uh, Diderot and d'Alembert. Uh, you know, it's a really uh, the bastion of the French Enlightenment. And here we can see human knowledge, many of the topics portrayed in this encyclopedia, represented as a tree, right? Uh, and as separate branches. But then of course, Human knowledge is all interconnected, as all of us can, can, can attest to. This is actually images of the, the, the interconnected nature of Wikipedia. These are covering two specific topics, history on the left and mathematics on the right. And they are essentially covering all types of hyperlinkage that exists in one specific article, either for history or mathematics. And we can really see this dense network of related concepts. Very much how we actually retain and make sense of, of knowledge in our brains. We can also, of course, see this paradigm shift in the way we organize our own structures, the way we organize ourselves. So this is the typical organizational chart for most companies, right, where we have the president or CEO at the very top, and, and a long chain of command all the way down to the individual workman. But of course, 
the web has changed dramatically how this uh, normally operates. What you have here is a visualization of Perl developers as they collaborate on, on a given project. And notice here that there's no centralized command. There's no CEO in control of the operation. It's a very distributed, decentralized, and flattened organization. Right? And as we are at the moment going through this COVID epidemic, we can relate to how this pandemic on its own is further changing this paradigm, right? Where people are now completely distributed across the globe, working and collaborating on fairly complex problems, right? It's again, much more like a network than a tree. We also see this in how we understand and visualize nature itself. The example that you see on the left is the only illustration uh, containing the origin of species by Charles Darwin. It was a very own, there's actually a letter from Darwin explaining how critical it was to include this specific illustration in the book. And Darwin called this diagram the tree of life. But fairly recent, scientists discovered that overlaying Darwin's original tree of life is a dense network of bacteria. And that's actually reshaping how scientists look at the classification of species altogether. And when you think that the human body is roughly made of 90% of the body is made of bacteria, it really makes you think about this, the potential for this new classification. And scientists are now calling this not the tree of life, but the web of life. What's also interesting is that as we are facing this paradigm shift and embracing this new visual metaphor, we are also creating a new language, a new visual alphabet with all these examples of network visualizations. So I wanna talk about what this actually means. I covered this extensively in my first book called Visual Complexity. And this is in many ways a taxonomy of all the different types or modalities of, of diagrams that were being created. So I'm just gonna show you a few of those. Here we can see how in one specific model at the very top, let's say radio convergence, you can use that to visualize uh, a network of IP addresses, right? Machines, servers, a network of Facebook friends, or even a genetic network. That's actually the three, what the three first examples are. So you couldn't really find more disparate types of topics and subjects, yet they are using a very similar construct. And these are other examples that I've been collecting again. I'm much more fascinated by the shared visual similarity of these, these new models that are emerging naturally, this kind of new alphabet is emerging as all scientists try to map out this inherently complex systems. And of course, in that process of mapping some of these fairly complicated structures and systems, we might fall into the trap, the common trap of taking the map for the structure, right? This is an example of mapping the internet. Every so often, you know, I, I run into an article in the media saying, this is how the internet looks like. This is the ultimate representation of the internet. And of course, that's not really true, right? And I always go back to this quote that I'm sure all of you know, that the map is not the territory. An important distinction for us to always remember. And the best example that comes to mind in representing this, this specific quote is this beautiful painting. It's arguably the most famous Japanese painting of all time, right? The Great Wave of Kanagawa. All of you have probably seen this painting, right? But what's interesting is that not everyone knows what the main subject of the, this painting actually is. Some people might think 
it's the tsunami, right? This massive wave about to, to crash down. Others might feel the main subject portrayed here is the, 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 the fisherman's struggle with the sea. As you can see, there are a couple of boats kind of struggling to keep afloat. But the main topic of this painting is actually Mount Fuji that you can actually see in the foreground, the highest mountain in Japan. In fact, this painting is part of a series of paintings depicting Mount Fuji called 36 Views of Mount Fuji. It's a collection, again, of 36 paintings depicting this, the mountain from every possible angle, from the, the, the plains, from the cities, from the village, from the ocean, right? The example that you saw before. It's almost as if you had a 360 degree angle on Mount Fuji, that you could see it from every possible perspective. So I love giving this example to anyone doing data science or data visualization, data analytics, because Mount Fuji in many ways is your territory, is your data set, right? And there's not a map that is the ultimate map, that is the best possible map. It's just a map. It's one possible angle into your Mount Fuji, into your data set. So which is the right map to pick, right? That's always the next question that comes up. Well, it really depends on a few things. And maybe it's, it's probably uh, the topic for another talk. It depends on the question you're trying to answer. It depends on the angle you're trying to convey. It also depends on the story you are trying to tell. So again, always think about your data set as being your Mount Fuji, the endless possibilities that you can pick to visualize and make sense of that data. So this is all we have time for today. And uh, if you want to know more about my work, these are actually uh, my, my, the three books that I've published, uh, Visual Complexity, The Book of Trees, and The Book of Circles. And I was fortunate over the years to be mentioned by many different types of media, from new scientists uh, to nature, Fast Company, New York Times, etc. So if you are curious about my work, I tend to say that you should read them in reverse order because I feel like I've been going deep into history. <laughs> so if you are new to my work and you want to explore it, maybe you should, uh, again, read them in reverse order. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And if you want to follow me for other talks and updates, you can follow me on Twitter and also, of course, on LinkedIn. So thank you so much for your time.